Okay, we will continue our look at physical methods used to control microorganisms. And we come to radiation. Radiation comes in two forms, ionizing radiation, which would be x-rays and gamma rays, and then non-ionizing radiation like UV light or ultraviolet light. Ionizing radiation can actually get into the cell, so it can alter molecular structure, so DNA. And this is one form that we looked at when we were talking about mutations. Ionizing radiation can cause breaks in the DNA molecule, which means mutations can occur and then we don't get the correct code, which means we don't get the correct proteins that can be produced. If we continue to expose the cells to ionizing radiation, eventually this is too much for the cell to overcome and the cell can die. X-rays and gamma rays can penetrate paper and plastic. Um, we can use ionizing radiation in the lab um, for things like plastic petri dishes. We can't put plastic petri dishes into the autoclave because the temperatures are such that they would melt. So when we use our plastic petri dishes in the lab, um, chances are that those have been sterilized using ionizing radiation. It can be used uh, to sterilize gloves or um, IV tubing, catheters, and things like that because um, ionizing radiation can be used for sterilization. Overseas, particularly in Europe, Ionizing radiation has started to really become popular um, for food preservation. We don't use it as much in the United States, um, but because um, we can use ionizing radiation uh, for food, it basically allows the food, particularly produce, um, to be able to last longer. So it reduces the waste of produce because the you know berries and lettuce and grapes and things like that can be stored longer before they spoil. Non-ionizing radiation, on the other hand, um, uses less energy than ionizing radiation and can really only be used for disinfection. Um, Non-ionizing radiation cannot penetrate into um, cells. Um, or packaging, so it can't go through paper or plastic. Um, we can use it in the lab. Um, UV lamps can be used in water purification. Um, they can be used um, in a clinical setting, you know, in a doctor's office. We will um, look at the use of UV light um, in a later lab and look at how long it takes for UV light to actually kill the microorganisms. Um, <clears throat> and it causes those thymine dimers that I talked about in my mutations lecture um, that causes adjacent thymines to um, form a bond between one another which interferes with DNA replication and protein synthesis. Sonication is using high-frequency ultrasound waves to disrupt cell structures. Um, this leads to what we call cavitation, which is the formation of bubbles inside the cell, which will eventually cause the cell to lice or basically explode. So it does kill the cell. Um, it can be used for surgical instruments um, and uh, like lenses, like, you know, contact lenses or uh, things like that. Um, but we're still, this is still in the, kind of the research phase. We don't know a lot about its application. Filtration is when we separate microbes from samples. Uh, one method of this is by using HEPA filters, which uh, HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air. Um, they have a very tiny pore size, um, small enough that it can catch bacterial cells, it can catch some viruses, endospores, and definitely, you know, mold spores get caught in these, um, in these HEPA filters. Um, 
it doesn't quite sterilize the air, but it comes really close. Um, HEPA filters are used in cars and airplanes, and now, of course, you can buy them for your home. Um, most vacuum cleaners now have HEPA filters in them, um, and you can buy them um, for like your central heat and air filters that you replace. They have HEPA filters for those as well. Now, HEPA filters are a little bit more expensive than normal filters, but your air is going to be uh, cleaner. Back when we were talking about BSL levels, um, we uh, were talking about how they work in a hood or in a safety cabinet, and those use um, HEPA filters as well. Um, and there are different classes that can be used depending on the level of um, biological safety. HEPA filters can be used in hospitals, they can be used in operating rooms, burn units. Um, if you have um, an isolation unit that requires, you know, patients to get their own air supply um, or highly filtered air, HEPA filters can be used for that as well. Another type of filtration is called membrane filtration, and this is what we use for liquids. Um, basically what happens is you have um, two containers with a filter in between them, and the pore size on this varies depending on what exactly you're trying to filter out. Um, typically, um, we can use a 0.2 micrometer uh, pore size, and that will filter out pretty much um, all bacteria, but it may let some viruses through. So again, it kind of depends on what your needs are. But what will happen is you'll pour the liquid in this top container, and then the bottom container is hooked up to this apparatus here um, that is basically a vacuum. So it's going to pull the substance through the filter into the lower container, and the filter here is going to capture um, the bacteria. This can be used um, for heat-sensitive solutions, so antibiotic solutions or vitamin solutions, things that could be damaged by heat can be um, filtered through the use of these membrane filters. This table here at the bottom of section 13.2 um, can be very helpful for you because it goes through all of the conditions that are required, um, how it works, so the mode of action, what it actually does to the cells, and then some uses that we can have for each one of these uh, physical methods of control.